this lecture has given me the opportunity to reflect on the extent of my psychological continuity, to use Derek Parfit's language, with my younger self. Parfit's influence has been wide rippling, of course, and what an honour it is to give the um, Parfit Memorial Lecture. His 1984 book, Reasons and Persons, was one of the first books that I read at the start of my PhD studies when I realised that I wanted to study rational choice over time in relation to time, something like that. Um, I wish I'd taken notes of that reading of, of Parfit because it would be quite interesting now. What I remember most and carried with me is the idea that Parfit was just speaking common sense and that his reasoning was clear and irresistible. Later, I realized that this was not the usual characterization of Parfit's work. <laughs> well, not maybe not the common sense part anyway. Funnily enough, when I was at the time when I was reading Parfit, I was also investigating the precautionary principle, which had just risen to prominence in international environmental law. Perhaps one's younger self sees more clearly what are the important issues uh, to work on such that one is wise to try to restore continuity with that self. I've started to think so lately. In any case, I return to the precautionary principle today in this lecture. Okay, so prominent sociologists have claimed that since the late 20th century, we live in or are a risk society. What looms large for us are manufactured risks due to human innovation, as opposed to natural hazards. We are accordingly no longer fatalistic about bad circumstances that befall us. We have a heightened awareness of our precarious position, and this fuels an acute desire to control for downside risks. It's all about controlling for risks. That is the possibility for bad outcomes or bad future trajectories. So this talk is not really about the risk society, a sociological theory that is no doubt much richer than, than my brief description just now. Um, I merely take inspiration from this vivid description of the modern psyche. My interest here is rather normative and concerns what we the people should be clamoring for as regards controlling for downside risks. In particular, to what extent should we want distinctly risk-averse decision-making on our behalf? I focus in particular on decision-making that is, that is explicitly for the common good, right? Such as we hope policymakers might engage in when they choose what institutions to create or what policies to implement. And in so doing, one might add, incentivize the choices of, of ordinary people's decisions of ordinary people. By the common good, I mean the good from an impartial, benevolent perspective. I'll say more about this shortly. There are other actors as well who we might hope engage in decision-making for the common good, um, not just policymakers, but for instance, non-governmental organizations and philanthropists as well. Whether or not they are responding to the anxieties of the risk society, policy and other such decision makers do now seem to reckon with the significant uncertainty that surrounds their choices. We can think of many like obviously or sort of advertised vexed decisions about the provision of humanitarian and development aid, about managing a global pandemic, about how to mitigate and adapt to climate change, as well as other evolving key threats to human well-being over the long term. So what is the right response to uncertainty when the common good is at stake? Arguably, the standard line of thought, apparently in keeping with the popular demands of the risk society, is that responsible decision-making must be precautionary, understood at least in part as in some sense risk averse with respect to the common good. The notion of the precautionary, precautionary principle arose in, in the 90s, as I mentioned, and despite being variously interpreted, the risk aversion aspect of this principle continues to serve as a guiding idea for responsible decision-making. And indeed, a number of contemporary theorists working in ethics and risk have adopted this guiding idea as at least a starting assumption, that when deciding on behalf of others, we should err on the safe side. Erring on the safe side certainly seems appealing. Indeed, it seems that everyone wants to be seen in this light, from the most conservative politicians to the most radical activists. That broad church should give us pause, however. 
Here, I'll defend a skeptical position regarding the role of caution or risk aversion in decisions for the common good. So first, I'll argue that in many practical decision uh, scenarios, it would be misleading to appeal to caution to justify a choice. Right? So this part of the lecture is aimed at the quality of public debate in the risk society and was not intended to be philosophically contentious. But it turns out that I do even here rely on a controversial claim about the lesser status of caution or risk aversion as a reason for choice. This claim calls for closer examination, which I'll do in the second part of the lecture. I'll argue in stages that risk aversion should not be privileged in decision-making for the common good. In fact, quite the contrary, risk neutrality should be privileged. There are more compelling ways to explain our intuitions about precautionary decision-making, which I'll get to at the end. Okay, so before beginning, it's worth just clarifying a few things about the decision-making that will preoccupy me in this lecture. The first is that I'm thinking of the common good in welfarist terms, right? So it's cast in terms of the people's welfare. So for instance, if two outcomes or prospects have the same distribution of welfare across anonymous individuals and they're ranked the same. So the common good understood in this way may be not all that matters morally, but it, it's at least important, right? Second, it's usual to refer to welfarist decisions made from the impartial benevolent perspective as the decisions of the impartial social observer. That's a <coughs> common way to sort of picture the decision maker. But I want to also draw attention here to how decisions are justified. So I'm going to use this term impartial social promoter because they're not just making the decisions or like making choices in an accurate way, but they're also engaged with the further task of justifying those choices. All right. We'll come to that. Um, third, our target is caution or risk aversion with respect to the common good or welfare itself, not just the constituents of welfare, not just risk aversion with respect to consumption, for instance, right? So later I'll use examples that involve numbers of lives saved just to keep the currency of welfare simple, you know. Um, you know consider a sure option of saving five lives versus a risky option that is a 50-50, you know, that's 50-50 between saving zero lives or 10 lives. The expected lives saved is the same for both options. So under risk neutrality, with respect to the common good, they are indifferent. But risk aversion favours the option uh, with less spread in the possible outcomes, right? So it favours the, the sure five lives. Okay, so for the moment in this part of the, the lecture, I'll accept that caution understood as risk aversion in some sense, can be legitimate in choosing for the common good, right? Like the, the impartial social promoter might be risk averse. Nonetheless, I claim that there are many cases in which appealing to caution to justify a choice is misleading and unwarranted. Right? So what I have in mind are scenario types that plausibly arise in practice and that commonly came up, at least in the early discussions of the precautionary principle. This is like sort of a semi-empirical claim, but I'm not really using any empirical evidence here. I'm just sort of sketching things that I plausibly arise in practice. Right. Um, so consider this decision problem between conserve, say, some piece of land or develop it, right? And here, you know, it looks like the uncertainty depends on the prospects for financial success. And let's say there's pretty high probability for big, big dollars, right? And low probability of losing money. Um, and conserve is just mm -mm, the status quo, nothing happens. So you might say, let's say you think you, your judgment is such that conserve is best, right? Now, a very cautious attitude with respect to dollars can justify the choice of conserve here. 
you know, might have to be pretty cautious because I'm um, just stipulating it's a high probability of financial success. And this may even be the right choice. It may be the choice that like everyone agrees with, like everyone can sort of see, you know, just in their internal decision making, it's really conserved, right? Um, but appealing to caution is not the right justification here. Why is that? Well, I need to give you more details. Suppose the model is misleading since dollars does not in fact totally predict social welfare or the common good, right? So there's a further predictor that's, that was missing in that table. It was sort of badly framed decision, call it ecosystem health. So now when we put ecosystem health in, we, we do have sort of all the information we need to, to calculate the common good, let's say. Um, and moreover, suppose that the severe loss of ecosystem health is not compensated by even the big dollars, right? Now, under all these suppositions, conserve dominates develop. And so we can see that caution would then really play no role in the argument for conserve, right? And it's misleading. It was misleading to initially refer to it. Now, I, I made a lot of suppositions here, right? Um, so I've kind of engineered this dominance case. But the point is to illustrate how a decision problem uh, can be badly framed from a welfareist point of view, which I think may often happen. And then caution is invoked to compensate for that error, to justify a choice that seems right. But that's obviously sort of sloppy and misleading. Under a better framing of the decision problem, we don't need to invoke caution to justify the choice, right? So we're sort of leaning sloppily on caution when we don't need to. And that's that's sort of what I, that's kind of the main thing that bothers me and is sort of, you know, my, uh, my main concern in this lecture almost. Uh, now, this is quite um, a crude example, but I think there are more subtle versions of this same kind of problem, this sort of disingenuous choice argumentation that appeals to, to caution. So note when the precautionary principle or the PP came into parlance, what counted as precautionary decision making was vaguely defined, or to put it more charitably, very inclusive. Um, on one notion of precautionary that I claimed in a 2006 paper to be the primary prescription of the PP. The choice of conserve over develop can count as precautionary here simply because it is chosen in an accurate way with respect to the common good, taking all influences on welfare into account, right? This has nothing to do with risk aversion. It is about the proper framing of decisions, that the proper perspective for a regulatory decision is not that of, say, the corporate developer, but rather that of the impartial social promoter. Moreover, when it comes to this perspective, being precautionary is not necessarily about privileging the worst case outcomes in the decision calculus, but rather just recognizing the worst case outcomes and evaluating them appropriately. So that may remain the best way to interpret the precautionary principle in a positive light, but I'm now more hesitant about this reading, and that's because precaution is strongly associated with risk aversion even if also with some other things. So to reduce confusion, we should interpret the precautionary principle, I suggest, as pres prescribing what it seems to say on the tin, some kind of risk aversion. In our example above, then we don't need to invoke precaution or the PP to justify the choice of conserve over develop. If we want a principle to capture our reasoning, we might just call it the clear-sighted principle or perhaps the holistic risk management principle. Here's a different uh, kind of case. So assume here that the outcomes are not under-described, crude as, crude as they may look there, uh, in terms of levels of uh, social welfare or the common good, right? Um, the states are different estimates for climate sensitivity, how the climate would respond to a doubling in CO2 levels since pre-industrial times. Um, a cautious attitude with respect to well-being would certainly justify, would it justify aggressive mitigation? Well, certainly extreme caution does, if we just focused on the very worst case, right? 
awful minus is worse than awful. Um, that may moreover seem like the right choice. Like maybe everyone just, you know, the, the, everyone sort of thinks for whatever reasons that they've kind of come up with on the back of envelopes or thinking about it elsewhere. They think that aggressive mitigation is the right choice. But is the appeal to caution the right justification for that choice? It seems a rather heavy handed argument here, right? We don't have a case of dominance by design. And I, I should say this decision model is sort of inspired by science. And again, like an observation of the sorts of arguments that I see occurring um, that are science based, but it's not, it's not intended to be strictly accurate, right? As you might get the gist of from the way those outcomes are described, et cetera. Um, so it's sort of illustrative still. Okay, so suppose that the probabilities for the states here, the values for the climate sensitivity, are such that aggressive mitigation is better in terms of expected welfare, as well as more risk averse weighted sums of welfare, and even more risk loving weighted sums of welfare up to a point, right? So under that supposition, if caution is then invoked to justify aggressive mitigation, then it would seem that the choice argument is again misleading, but now for a different reason. The problem is that a cautious attitude to risk and with respect to welfare is not necessary for establishing that aggressive mitigation is better than timid mitigation, right? Any old risk attitude, apart from the more extreme end of risk loving, say, would yield the same ranking of the options. So, don't use caution. <laughs> um, so I take my point here to be very much in line with common sense. If you don't need to invoke risk aversion with respect to welfare itself in justifying your choice, don't mention it. Don't mention the risk aversion, right? Um, but interestingly, thinking through it, it doesn't seem quite so straightforward. So the more precise articulation of this maxim is here in blue. Um, even a risk averse impartial social promoter would justify their choices by appeal to as logically weak a reason of risk aversion as possible, right? That's kind of the idea. Um, like even if you, you know, maybe it's permissible for the impartial social promoter, for the social planner, to be risk averse, they shouldn't rely on it if they don't have to. But this conclusion put more carefully, I think, is seen to rely on at least one substantive premise. So I've sort of tried to lay it out carefully here. So the first premise, I'm just saying, look, reasons for choice concern one, the values, you know, the characterization of social welfare for us, two, the credences or the probabilities over the states, and three, the decision rule, including the risk attitude. Now, this is supposed to just be a stipulation, right? And uh, a way of organizing the way I'm talking about reasons for choice. So apologies if I'm using the term reasons here rather loosely by some people's tastes. Premise two, it is better when justifying a choice to rely on a logically weaker reason of a given kind, all else being equal, right? Um, so that may be a little controversial, but it articulates a particular notion of better and worse arguments for choice that I think is kind of natural and useful. And I'm not going to claim anything more for it. It is supposed to be analogous to better and worse contrast of scientific explanations, right? Why is this option better than that option is analogous to why did this event occur in the world rather than that event? In both cases, the better argument or explanation is arguably the one that can make, that can explain the difference by appeal to the most abstract or logically weakest difference maker, holding other conditions fixed, right? Now, I think applied ethicists arguably use this standard in their arguments. Um, the usual strategy is to show that some practical ethical conclusion, you know, about sort of taxation policy or something, um, is not highly sensitive to the proponent's favoured ethical position, but is rather robust to considerable variation in ethical position, 
Okay, so what I want to draw attention to is premise three. The best choice arguments regarding the common good are those that rely as little as possible on deviations from risk neutrality with respect to welfare. Now, this is clearly a rather substantive premise, although it sort of seems natural to me, um, in that it downgrades a reason of risk aversion relative to other types of reasons comprising a choice argument. It seemed right to say that caution has no role in justifying the choice of aggressive mitigation in our choice problem just before. But perhaps that was too quick, and we see this once we make premise three explicit, right? If risk aversion to some degree were required of the social promoter when making choices, just like a particular ethical position regarding social welfare, then why would the better choice argument be the one that weakens the risk attitude reason rather than say the social welfare reason, right? Hold your risk aversion fixed and like, woo, look how we can get this option better than the other for all these different social welfare functions, right? In intuitively for me, we should go the other way. We should be we want it, the strongest arguments are the ones where you can weaken the risk aversion, as little deviation from risk neutrality as possible. So premise three, in fact, says even more, it privileges risk neutrality. Um, it's not as if by premise three, the social promoter in justifying their choices avoids any risk attitude commitments. They avoid any deviation from risk neutrality insofar as they can. Okay, so I set out in this first part of the talk with the intention of making fairly uncontroversial comments about the overuse of caution or risk aversion in justifying public choices in public debate. If you don't need to rely on caution, don't mention it. But simple as this sounds, we see that its truth seems to depend on the answer to this deep question about the status of caution as a reason for choice when the common good is at stake. So we'd better tackle that question head on. Okay, so in tackling it, I wanna to turn to decision problems in which the right choice seems relatively sensitive to the level of risk aversion. So we can sort of test our ideas about it, right? I'll begin with simple decision problems and then move on to more complicated ones. Um, in both cases, I'm going to argue that the best explanations are, of our intuitions don't invoke risk aversion and that um, ultimately risk neutrality is privileged. Okay. So the few who have carefully defended risk aversion on the part of the social planner, as they call it, um, although I have to say I believe it to be a fairly widespread hunch that many have, even if they haven't defended it, um, have focused primarily, or at least for starters, on simple cases like this where the fate of community members is aligned, you know, even identical. So imagine, for instance, that this table represents the decision of an agricultural community about whether to rent water storage facilities for all to use. Renting is the safe option allowing a good crop for all, but at some cost, a sure outcome. Not renting is risky. Either it will result in a good crop for all at no cost, hooray, 200, or it will result in a failed crop for all, zero. So I'm actually gonna use this decision table to represent a few different decision scenarios here. So notice just when you're looking at this table that we now have three dimensions in our decision problem. Since we're interested in the individuals who comprise the full collective, right? So they're the rows, and I'm only representing two groups here, right? And the groups are divided, the people are divided in terms of their risk attitudes. So group one is risk neutral. Um, they therefore prefer the risky option, expected value of 100 compared to 60, right? Well, everyone in group two is risk averse to some specific extent. And I'm going to say they actually prefer the safe option. There are two choice options here, as you can see, and two relevant states of the world, which we have to sort of duplicate for both choice options because we're dealing with the three dimensions. Okay, so here the common good just plausibly equates to everyone's individual good, a sort of unanimity principle. Um, 
Let me say a bit more about risk aversion with respect to social in or individual welfare, since it can be operationalized in different ways, right? So it could just be, you could model it like this, decision utility is concave with respect to welfare, right? Like the diminishing marginal utility of money, but here the diminishing marginal utility of welfare or lives in our more simple cases that will come later. So risk aversion with respect to welfare uh, can be consistent with expected utility theory. But perhaps it's clearer to have in mind when thinking about these sorts of social choices, a version of Lara Bouchak's decision theory, where, one where the decision utilities match welfare, right, sort of keeps things separated nicely. Um, but the weightings for the states are not simply equivalent to the probabilities of the states. Rather, for each choice option, each probabilistic increment of welfare from the worst outcome up is underweighted relative to the probability of the increment. As Bouchard puts it, the weight of what happens in the top P portion of states the, where there's better outcomes is transformed by a convex risk function so that as P gets smaller, what happens in these states matters proportionally less and less. Right? She says it best. Um, some say that these aligned risk cases call for a privileging of the more risk averse attitudes of the people of the people by the social promoter. So, and we've got this sort of Bouchard style risk aversion in mind. So when I said group two were risk averse, you can think of them as um, using a, a rule, a, a, a version of Bouchard's risk weighted uh, expected welfare. Now, Bouchard herself takes a fairly extreme position in this regard. According to her, when choosing on behalf of a group of persons, one should adopt the most risk averse of those persons' risk attitudes, provided it's within the bounds of the reasonable, which are apparently pretty wide bounds, as I understand it. And if one lacks information about the risk attitudes of the people, one should simply adopt the most risk averse, reasonable risk attitude. Right. So let's just add a few numbers, right? Um, Actually, I should have added these before because I already made statements that relied on them, as you might have noticed. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm adding that the probabilities for the states are 0.5. So that's why we get uh, group one has expectation of 100 um, for the risky option. Um, let's also just use the very standard uh, risk function where we square the probability. All right, for the risk averse group, group two. So that means that instead of weighting the increment of 200 by 0.5, they only weight it by 0.25. Um, and so that ends up having value 50 for them. So they prefer the safe option, right? That's the risk averse crew. So Bouchard argues for the moral significance of risk aversion when choosing on behalf of others on the grounds that one would be criticizable if one chose otherwise. But why would one be criticizable? She goes on to say, look, all disappointments require justification, but just disappointments experienced by those who are worse off require more justification, right? And sort of more weight should be given to them. The idea is that if the risky option were chosen and state one arose, the people would have disappointment worth 60 units. They could have had the safe option of 60. If the safe option were chosen and state two arose, of course, the people would have disappointment worth 140 units, right, because they could have had 200, not 60. Even though 140 is much larger than 60, the 60 means more because it happens to the, the absolutely worse off. And that's enough to tip the balance here in favor of the safe option. But an odd move is made in this argument, I think. The measure of disappointment here is conditional on a given state being true, but the significance of that very disappointment is then assessed in an unconditional way. After all, if state two were true for our decision problem, the worse off would actually be those people um, under state two who are now disappointed by 140. It seems illegitimate to treat the disappointment of these worse off people as less important than the ones under state one for the risky option. 
So one might say that state-dependent disappointments are not comparable across states, at least when it comes to determining kind of legitimate complaints of the people. Anyway, perhaps the privileging of risk aversion when deciding for others is nonetheless simply right, a basic moral maxim. So Richard Pettigrew here uh, considers a less extreme position than Bouchard's. Um, it's actually only a small part of his paper, and I'm kind of going to blow it up as, uh, as, uh, as a major part. Uh, he, too, appeals to the risk-weighted expected welfare rule. According to Pettigrew, when choosing on behalf of others, one's risk attitude is plausibly an appropriate aggregate, say a weighted linear average of the expected risk attitudes of the people concerned, right? but with proportionally greater weight to the more extreme of those risk attitudes. So we're deferring to the more risk averse, but only uh, to a certain extent, right? The impartial social promoters risk attitude is skewed in the direction of the more risk averse. And, you know, perhaps this fits better with intuition. It's, it's sort of a weaker claim about the privileging of risk aversion. So, Richard's suggestive example involves eight hikers on a guided mountaineering trip. Their guide is forced into, by circumstance, into a position of choosing a group strategy on their behalf. So their, their decision model might be like ours here, where the risky option is the group altogether attempting the summit despite the threat of bad weather, and the safe option is where the group altogether retreats to the base camp, right? but the hikers' risk attitudes differ. So five of the hikers are risk neutral, group one, and three of them are risk averse, and so they like the safe option. Now, it's suggested that the safe option is plausibly the right choice for the guide here. You know, the risk averse hikers are a minority, but intuitively they're a big enough minority to skew the common good decision towards the safe option, right? Now, this particular example, however, has some unique features such that it is doubtful whether the lessons generalize. So some people claim that it's a difficult uh, example to understand if you're not into mountain climbing, right? So I was reading this, I was reading Richard's paper carefully with a colleague, a colleague in Stockholm, and he was like, why would anyone want to go to the summit anyway when you could be cozying down in base camp having some hot chocolate um, so anyway but that's more seriously um, for a dangerous mountain expedition surely it matters whether or not it is done voluntarily or at least whether or not consent would hypothetically be given by each hiker so in that case, the welfare of the individuals and the social outcomes is more complicated than first appearances suggest, or else the question of consent makes considerations of welfare kind of less relevant. No, no wonder we feel that we should side with the more risk averse hikers when to do otherwise means forcing people up a dangerous mountain they are reluctant to climb, right? So moreover, when the story is more like that of the agricultural community, it's like less clear as far as intuitions go that the more risk averse attitudes matter more. So in sum, I'm a bit skeptical. It seems like when we get examples like the hikers example that do like really push us in favor of going with the risk averse, that seems to be due to unusual features of, that, of cases such as that, right? And examples that lack these unusual features uh, arguably, you know, we've only we've only considered two here, but do not so readily seem to support privileging to any extent the attitudes of the more risk averse. All right, um, that's about all I can say about that. So I'm going to move on. So far, I've been casting doubt on the privileging of more risk averse attitudes in deferring to the people on risk attitudes. But now I want to pursue some problems for the social promoter adopting any deviation from risk neutrality. So I, I want to uh, appeal to two lines of argument, um, only briefly the first. Um, so one is sort of recent, sort of a recent groundswell in impossibility or rather limited possibility theorems. Um, and the second is about sort of, a more concrete 
type of argument. It's just really hard to find a way to kind of come up with an appropriate aggregate of the risk attitudes of the people that seems to that seems plausible across cases. Okay, so I can't really do justice um, here to the theorems, various generalizations of John Hassani's argument for expectational utilitarianism from the 1950s that established that the social planner cannot be risk averse with respect to welfare, neither social nor individual welfare. And I'm just, I'm a consumer of these results for starters at this stage. Um, and they have various differences. I mentioned various results that sort of have stronger and weaker axioms of various kinds. Um, so what I'm showing here is follows Richard Bradley's 2022 result. So the idea is that the social promoter faces decision problems like those in the tables we've been considering, right? The entries in the cells are the welfare levels for the individuals under a given option and state of the world. Now, the impartial social promoter must determine betterness orderings for the option state pairs or social outcomes, the columns in the decision tables, right? They have to order the columns. Uh, the option individual pairs or individual prospects, the rows in the table, and the overall options. And then there's a bunch of further conditions that we might apply that are quite seem quite limited, right? Social outcome anonymity. This just means the social promoter is indifferent between social outcomes for which the distribution of individual well-being is the same, only the people are shuffled, right? Um, Statewise dominance, if for all states, one option yields a social outcome that is at least as good as the social outcome for the other option, then the former option is at least as good as the latter option. And then a limited ex ante Pareto condition uh, that only applies when the social outcomes state by state have equivalent social features, right? In these cases, if for all individuals one option is at least as good as another, then the former is socially at least as good as the other. If in addition for at least one individual the so one option is better, then the former option is socially strictly better than the latter. So surprisingly, these limited conditions, and maybe you can make them more limited, uh, effectively restrict the evaluation of social and individual prospects to having expectational form, risk neutrality with respect to welfare, right? You just have to accept that for now. Um, still, one might think there's bound to be a conflict between these conditions, limited as they may be, uh, in particular between an ex post oriented statewide dominance condition and an ex ante Pareto condition, right? So you might kind of imagine a debate along these lines. The detractor says, why should we accept that the ordering of social prospects restricts the ordering of individual prospects and vice versa? Because these theorems sort of establish sort of coherence result. The defender says these orderings should cohere well together, right, just like preferences and beliefs in expected utility theory. And the detractor says, but statewise dominance and ex ante Pareto are motivated in entirely different ways, right, the ones focusing on social outcomes um, from the social perspective and the other ones from the individual perspective. The defender says, look, Let's assume statewide dominance is primary. Surely it still speaks in favor of an option that is judged better for all individuals concerned. The detractor says, but there may be features that are only apparent at the social level that favor the other option, counteracting the consensus at the individual level. The defender might say, yes, however, under that limited ex ante Pareto condition, there are no such counteracting social features. It was limited to only ex ante Pareto when the two options for all states of the world have social outcomes with the same features. But the detractor might say, even so, an equivalence between options at the social level undermines 
even if it doesn't counteract any consensus in favour of one option at the individual level, showing it to be based on limited viewpoints. They could go on, even though option A is better than option B for all the individuals concerned, it turns out that this apparent advantage of option A is undermined or shown to be superficial at the social level. Because at that level, we see that the options A and B are effectively identical. Right, so sort of trying to like get rid of ex ante Pareto. These impossibility theorems are relying on dominance and Pareto together, force risk neutrality, right? Um, so I'm sort of trying to imagine a conversation where we like chuck out ex ante Pareto. <laughs> um, so I'm giving the ex ante Pareto skeptic the last word here. But the minimality of the conditions which force neut risk neutrality with respect to welfare is impressive, right? Um, this structural result arguably makes risk neutrality at least the default position, I would say. So you've got to work hard, I would say. You've got to come up with some good reasons uh, to go otherwise. Right, so defaults may indeed not be the last word. So let's consider further the idea that the social promoter's risk attitude may be some aggregate of the risk attitudes of the individuals. But now we run into what I will call um, concrete constructivist worries. Um, about exactly how to do this. So I'm gonna stick with the most obvious way that we're getting the aggregate risk attitude is just sort of taking, say, a simple linear average of the risk attitudes of the people. But in various cases, like this simple aggregation will have some odd consequences. Okay, so consider this decision problem. Short and long here stand for longevity, right? Here, the main determinant of welfare, right? long lives, short lives. So the risks are non-aligned, unlike our previous case. This is a more complicated case. Since one part of the population, group one, fares better under speculative medical aid, right, where they get long life for sure. In fact, that's dominating. Uh, while the other part of the population, group two, fares better under standard medical aid. And indeed, that's dominating for group two because they get the long life there. Okay, so let's just introduce some numbers to make it more vivid. Group one contains a thousand people, and state one has probability of only 0.01, right? Group two has eight people, a small group. So the standard medical aid has, has one terrible outcome uh, for these thousand people with the short lives. Uh, but in expectation, only 10 short lives and the rest long lives. Well, in expectation, 10 short lives and the rest long lives. While speculative medical aid has expected eight short lives uh, and, a, and a thousand long lives, the rest long lives. So if the, risk, if the social promoter were risk neutral here, they'd therefore choose the speculative medical aid. That's in fact the safe option. Uh, despite the name, uh, or maybe counterintuitively with respect to the name, as it has fewer expected short lives. So standard medical aid is the risky option and speculative med medical aid is the safe, safe option, but here, <clears throat> sorry, the safe option is also higher in expectation. Okay, what if the social promoter instead looked to the people to decide here what risk attitude to take? The problem is that the risk attitudes of the people may stay, stand in a strange relationship to what is at stake for them, right? So for example, suppose that the group two people are highly risk loving and those in group one are risk neutral with respect to welfare. So it actually doesn't affect their individual uh, prospects because they're dominating in each case. But strangely, if these guys are like enough risk loving, that may shift the social promoter's judgments in their favor, right, towards standard medical aid, which is the risky option, right? Um, that seems somewhat of a conflict of interest. Now, 
it, even if they were risk averse, then this would actually reinforce a choice that's bad for them personally. And that also seems odd, you know, but in a slightly different way. Now, that's just one example, but I think the diagnosis here is a general one, that there is something odd about divorcing the people's risk attitudes from what they stand to gain or lose when deciding on their behalf, right? It's very hard to see how the social promoter can aggregate the risk attitudes of the people in a way that's properly representative representative of them in these non-aligned complicated cases. We might just get kind of an aggregate of biases, if you like. Okay, so that's the second part. Um, I've been doing all this to try to defend that premise three from my initial arg argument in, in, uh, in part one of the lecture, right? Risk, and I feel like We've come to the point, risk aversion with respect to the common good is not plausibly a requirement. It is at best a permission. And there are strong doubts even about that. The maxim, if you can make your choice argument without appealing to some deviation from risk neutrality, then you should do so, seems right after all. Right. That's what I want to say. Um, so... Does the story then end there, down with risk aversion on the part of the impartial social promoter? Well, not exactly. It's worth trying to explain common judgments about what are more and less precautionary choice options. So despite appearances, however, these judgments do not seem to consistently favour risk aversion anyway. So this might be sort of another argument against risk aversion that it doesn't do a good job sort of tracking our precautionary intuitive judgments, even if it appears like it, it would, right? So we need a different explanation of what is going on, even putting aside worries about the reasonable, reasonableness of risk aversion. So what I want to appeal to um, is, an, is an augmented notion of the welfare of the individuals in the context of real <coughs> practical social decisions. So I, what I have in mind here is sort of something in the spirit of Parfit's Thielic versus deontic egalitarianism, right? So Parfit talked of deontic egalitarianism as the position that equality is a matter of justice that may only arise in the context of deliberate choice. Like there's something about deliberate choice that adds extra considerations, right? Um, here I want to use this basic idea that deliberate choice does raise further considerations to do with how one is treated that affects individuals' welfare. So I'm sort of treading a fine line here because I want to stay welfareist, but I'm like, I want to add, uh, add to welfare in the context of deliberate choice, right? Something to do with being respected, uh, being treated properly in these deliberate choice scenarios. So recall the earlier point about hypothetical consent for the hikers example. That seems like something that, you know, should be part of augmented deontic welfare. Um, another avenue that one might pursue, because there's sort of many, many possibilities to explore here, um, it, especially if you want, you still think the risk attitudes of the people are important, is that you might add an agent's own attitudes towards risk into their welfare, right? They might augment their welfare with like a risk differential for all their outcomes. Um, and that sort of keeps their risk attitude with their fate in a way that I thought was problematic before when we separated the two. Um, so indeed, some choice theorists have pursued models that may be interpreted in this way. And I think you can do this for any kind of risk aversion model, just slap it into the, you know, put it in the outcomes. Um, but actually, that's not, um, that's not the, the, the type that I want to discuss here. I want to focus on uh, this kind of augmented welfare, uh, which I think is needed to explain various precautionary judgments about choice options that might otherwise seem inconsistent, right? So here, the augmentation of welfare 
uh, occurs around this reference point. Like many people think it's of it as the status quo, but it might just be the perceived status quo or the perceived entitlements of the community, right? The perceived normal, what we should have, right? And um, you can see the way that it works. This graph just shows a very simple linear transformation of welfare, but with different gradients above and below the reference point. So basically gains above the reference point are downgraded, you know, on the day on the augmented welfare, uh, whereas losses below the reference point are upgraded. Like emphasize the losses, downgrade the gains. Now, versions of this sort of augmented welfare are independently argued for by ethicists. Example, consider the doing allowing distinction. Doing harm, a loss is worse than allowing harm, foregoing a gain. It's a bit like this diagram. Sort of. I, mean, that I don't think they're going to like my welfareist interpretation, but I'm going to uh, take some take some confidence from that distinction, nonetheless. Um, anyway, um, I said that we seem to need something like this anyway to explain our intuitive judgments. Okay, so. Risk aversion involves greater concern for worst case outcomes. What if the choice is about whether to lower the probability of a catastrophic outcome, right? As we hear some discussion of these days, at some opportunity cost. Now, sometimes we, the people, do seem to think that precaution favors lowering the probability of catastrophic outcomes. So consider Martin Weissman's a point in response to the 2007 Stern Review on climate change, he emphasised the scale of the catastrophic outcomes associated with business as usual climate change, right? Um, and the, the idea was sort of to make aggressive climate change mitigation even more choice worthy on a risk neutral calculation, right? It gets even worse in expectation when you have, when you sort of make the worst outcomes really bad. Now, risk aversion with respect to the common good would bolster the case even more for aggressive mitigation um, in line with the direction that I think many do regard as the right precautionary direction. But so too would an augmentation of welfare under which a stable climate is the perceived status quo or entitlement. Like this would also accord with intuitions that like, yeah, it is, it is really important. Precaution favors even more that we should like lower the probability of this catastrophic outcome, right? Um, so how would it work? It would be as if it were analogous to this medical case again, but now if you look at the entries in red, these are registering the losses and gains. So I'm just gonna, it's as if the speculative medical aid, the normal, that's the normal climate is sort of the reference point. And now, you know, we see we've got losses, a big potential loss if we shift to standard medical aid and then just some tiny gains. So we're going to stick with speculative medical aid, right? Um, and that seems to be in line with our intuitions, at least on this telling of the story where I'm like using the analogy with climate change. Times, however, we, our intuitions seem to go the other way, right? We balk at absorbing the opportunity costs associated with lowering the probability of catastrophic outcomes. For, for example, consider cases, you know, whether real or hypothetical, where it is stipulated that there's a low probability of a really terrible AI-related future, and we could make that low probability even lower at modest opportunity cost. For many, this doesn't seem like the responsible precautionary response. In fact, you know, as effective altruists, you know, maybe uh, frustrated by, um, or at least it seems that precaution should not should not bolster the case for the option of lowering the probability of the catastrophic outcome. I mean, in the end, the choice may go either way, but the question is like, which way? Which way does precaution push? Yet risk aversion does bolster the case for this option as before, right? Lowering the probability of the catastrophic outcome. Augmented welfare has more flexibility, right? 
It does not bolster the case for this option if the perceived status quo or entitlements are the other way around compared to what they were before. So now make the standard medical aid the, stat the, the perceived reference point, which is, I think is what is happening here. Like we, we're not familiar with these weird risks that people sometimes tell us about. We just think they're part of the status quo, right? Um, and so we're worried about losses now from the status quo, it's sort of uh, pushing us to keep the status quo here because now the shift involved um, those losses for the eight people. Okay. So now, yeah, we're more reluctant to take on this case. So this seems that we can sort of explain our intuitions in this way. So the point is, it seems like we need something else, a different adjustable parameter if what we're interested in is explaining our intuitive judgments about proportion, right? Not levels of risk aversion with respect to the common good. Now, you might say, well, look, all this just shows that our judgments are not reliable, they're subject to framing effects, as Kahneman Tversky put it. Um, that may be so, and I, I've not really made a compelling normative case for this sort of reference point idea. Um, I do think that this notion of welfare is important and tracks a sense in which we, the people, are conservative relative to a reference point, right? We have some kind of anchoring of what we expect, uh, but a careful argument is wanting. My point here is more limited. Our intuitive judgments about a variety of cases do not seem to provide a consistent case for risk aversion with respect to the common good. All right, so maybe we should focus elsewhere on the distribution of possible outcomes and their relative welfarist value. All right, I'm about to finish and I'm I realize I'm I've kept you a long time now so return to the plight of the impartial social promoter what I've been arguing for here <clears throat> from various angles is that they should choose according to a vanilla risk neutral expectational decision rule with respect to the common good with respect to welfare itself so I introduced this notion of augmented welfare at the end by way of explaining our intuitions but of course you know it's pretty sketchy if you have to rely on that to justify a choice and the details of any such notion will be debatable so the core issue i think or what i sort of think is really going on here is that we're rightly disturbed by fragile choice arguments when the comparison of options is highly sensitive to the characterization of their respective possible outcomes, right? We don't like that. It's uncomfortable. Now, one might add that this sensitivity is particularly worrying when the expected disappointment, whatever option is chosen, is relatively large, right? It's not as if one option just pips another whatever state of the world um, occurs. That would be a sensitive choice, but like not much at stake there. Um, it's rather that in different states, different options win on lose, or, you know, a lot hangs on what happens in the tails of the distribution of outcome, the extreme tails. Um, so the choice options that we were considering at the end in the second part had that tail feature to some extent, at least. So the point is risk aversion with respect to welfare is not the panacea for like doing something about fragile choice arguments. That's not going to get us out of the fragility. We should not try to make fragile choice ar arguments sturdy just by like shifting out, shifting the dial on risk aversion. Like, oh, let's just focus on the worst case. Oh, now we've got to, now we can all feel comfortable and go home. No, they're fragile choice arguments and they're sensitive choices, right? Um, and perhaps that's all there is to say, like, yes, these are worrying choices, vulnerable to disagreement about what is the best option, you know, given the scope for disagreement about the, all the parameters. If there's any hope in making a fragile choice argument more sturdy, whereby one option is clearly favoured, 
It is through revisiting, you know, maybe but via a reflective equilibrium process, the welfareist value function and the credence function over the possible outcomes of the options, right? Now, you know, this just may be wishful thinking, but it's worth a try, right? Something might have been overlooked, you know. Uh, so, for instance, that's how I interpret John Broom's response to Weitzman's models. Uh, but maybe on closer inspection, the extreme tail of the distribution of climate outcomes is not the major difference maker when it comes to mitigation options, right? A lot of stuff's happening in the middle. You know, it's such that it's closer to sort of a dominance argument in favour of mitigation, let's say. And it's also how I interpret those who call for further examination of ordinary institution building by way of responding to diverse te technological threats to the common good. Here again, on maybe on closer inspection, the extreme tail of the distribution of outcomes is not the difference maker. It gets something closer to a dominance argument, you know, if we look at all the stuff in the middle. Um, yeah. So anyway, what the risk society should crave may be better described as the clear-sighted principle or the holistic risk management principle. I use the latter term just because it may also involve other substantive ideas that were initially associated with the precautionary principle to do with like coordinating the decisions of many people and systems of liability and so on. Indeed, what the risk society should crave, what will keep us safe, is surely much more substantive than a particular risk attitude on the part of the social promoter. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.